Okay, hello everyone again. Uh, hope you're having a good week so far. You're halfway through. Um, thanks for joining. So, to this evening, I'm going to cover hypothesis testing. So we're moving on to the next learning unit. I believe it's learning unit eight. So let me share my screen. Um, And just let me know when you can see this whiteboard where it says the manager of a large shopping mall, etc. Um, yes, okay, fantastic. Let's go back. All right. So in this learning unit, basically, um, what you're covering is how to test something statistically. So it's not good enough to just do it by an opinion because that's subjective. You know, you could have an opinion, I could have an opinion about something, um, but we want data to justify it. And then there's no argument behind it. And that's what hypothesis testing is. Okay, you, what, what happens is you have a theory or you believe something. And in order to check whether that theory is true, you will gather some data, all right? So you will go and uh, observe something, take measurements, and then you'll test test this theory statistically. And that's what hypothesis testing is. So let's look at this example to kind of give you an idea. All right, and this is a typical, typical kind of an example that you can get uh, tested on or assessed on. So the, I'll read it out. The manager of a large shopping mall in Naisna believes that visitors to the mall spend on average 85 minutes in the mall on any one occasion. To test this belief, the manager commissioned a study, which found that from a random sample of 132 visitors to the mall, the average visiting time was 80.5 minutes. So assume that the population is a standard deviation of 25 minutes and that the visiting time is normally distributed. So let me try and put things in perspective here, okay? What happens is, in the first line, it says the manager of a large shopping mall in Eisner believes that visitors to the mall spend on average 85 minutes. So here, from, from this manager's observation, right, he or she, uh, what they've noticed from their experience, right, because they're pretty much, uh, you know, a staff member of the mall, they can, over a long period of time, they can observe one person come in, another person, et cetera. And this could be over a couple of months, et cetera. Right, so each cross represents a person, and let's say this is me. I go into the mall, all right, and then he takes a measurement of how long I spend in the mall. Okay, so I could spend maybe 70 minutes, all right, whereas let's say someone else, person two, goes in and they spend about 90 minutes. Person three spends about 80 minutes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what you'll do is, what what this <clears throat> manager believes is that on average, maybe throughout the year. If you add up all our times and you average it, so say there was 10,000 of us, okay? You take all our times, you add it up, and you divide by 10,000. And what that manager believes is that that average is around 85. That's what the manager believes. Now, for, for me, the statistician that comes in to do this investigation, I don't have that luxury of time uh, spending the entire year observing this. So maybe, I can get commissioned to do this uh, test uh, over a period of a month. So my sample is going to be smaller. Okay, so it's it's probably just going to be a very small fraction of it. And this is what's happening right now. What they're saying is there's a sample of 132. So if you read the text, it says here, what happens is I take 132 people, so it's a sample of it, and I get the average of these people, so whatever's in the screen circle. And I can measure this because I can, it's a reasonable amount of time for me. So that average time there for me is 80.5 minutes. Okay, so that's what it says here. From the, from the sample of 132 visitors, the average visiting time was 80.5. So this is 80.5, okay? All right, so this is the sample average, 80.5. So this, uh, let me go back to color. Black. 
right? This 80.5 is the sample average. Spa equals 80.5. And this 85 is the true average, what the manager believes, what the claim is. I'm just going to pause there for a second so everyone understand what I just explained uh, up until this point. Cool, fantastic. All right, fantastic. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Now let's look at the first question, right? First question is question A. Right? It says, formulate the null and alternative hypothesis to test the situation. So what happens is I need to test whether this manager's claim is true. This manager believes that the average, the true average 85. So this is what the manager believes. Mu equals 85. Okay, this is gonna second, I'm just gonna switch to my pen. And on the right here, this is the manager's claim. And, the, and we'll call this the null hypothesis, H0. It's rep, null hypothesis represented by H0, okay? I'll explain the, what the null and alternative hypothesis is right now. Then there's only two hypotheses. There's the null and the alternative. The alternative is that his claim is not true. And we represent that by H1. So there's H0 and H1. Now, if you, re if you read this text, right, the question, it's telling you that the manager believes that the average is 85. It doesn't tell you that the manager believes it's more than 85 or less than 85. This manager believes it's exactly 85. So there's an equals to sign. So the opposite of that is not equals to. So whatever your H0 is, your H1 is the opposite of it. So that's not equals to. So that's the alternative hypothesis, okay? And just know, okay, I'll explain this in a second, but just know that when there's an equals to sign in your H0, then it's a two-tailed test. You would, you would need to state this, okay? So it's a two-tailed test. All right, all right. So what hypothesis testing is, it'll be a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, okay? And when you do this test, your, your test is basically gonna decide whether H0 is true or whether H1 is true, all right? So that's question A, all right? Question A, that's, that's what I just done now. This is it, all right? Yeah. Now, question B says, which Test statistics, Z or T, is appropriate for this test and why? Okay, now what you need to remember is in this test, you are testing averages. If you read the text, it says on average, yeah, on average 85. So when you're dealing with averages, there's only two types of tests that you can use. You can either do the Z test or the normal test, Z, or T. And how you decide which one to use is you would need to look at the sample size for one. Firstly, if the sample size is more than 30, and more than 30, if it's more than 30, and if you look at our sample, it's the green thing I've done here. If you read the text, that sample size is 132. So it's a lot bigger than 30. If your N is bigger than 30, already you know that you need to use the Z statistic. Okay, that's how you can determine if you use the Z or the T. So just the opposite of that, if N is less than 30, right, then use the T statistic. Okay, so you, you, could, you could probably put equal say if you want here. Um, say unlikely you'll get asked for exactly 30, but just use this guideline, uh, at least 30 or more, use the Z stat, and for less than 30, use the T stat. Just note, there is one thing that trumps all of this, okay? If N is uh, less than 30, you can still use the Z statistic if they tell you that it's normally distributed. So remember, see, if you read this question, it says it's normally distributed, okay? If it's normally distributed, it doesn't matter what the sample size is, you will always use Z, okay? Make a note of that. Because Z is your normal distribution. T 
T is actually the T distribution, and we'll get to that not in this section or, or this collab, in another collab, I'll cover that. But for now, remember, if it's normally distributed, use the Z statistic. If they don't say that it's normally distributed, but you can see that your sample size is bigger than 30, use the Z statistic. All right, make a note of that. So that's question B. Okay, which statistic? We use the Z statistic. And why? Because our sample size is greater than or equal to 30. Right? And the, we are told that the data is normally distributed. All right, those are the two reasons you can provide. So that's question B. All right, now we're going to get to pretty much the, the bulk of this hypothesis testing, and that is done by answering question C. Okay, so let me just clear the board. I'm just going to keep A there because I'm going to refer to it. Okay, now hypothesis testing, when you are testing the hypothesis, there are five steps to it. Okay, there are five steps. Step one is declare the hypothesis, which is what we've done already in question A. This is step one. So step one is done. All right, done. So remember what I said, there's five steps. So we've done step one. Now we move on to step two. And this is answering question C. You're going to Complete step two, three, four, and five in order to answer question C. All right. So step two is determine the region to reject H naught. So where? Uh, what, what what I'll write is what is the rejection region? That's what we're trying to figure out here. What is the rejection RG region? Okay, now how we figure that out is, first thing you need to do is look at what alpha is given to you, what alpha is given to you. And what I mean by alpha, alpha, alpha is the same thing as level of significance. So alpha and your level of significance is the same thing. So whenever you see level of significance, that is your alpha. So what I mean by alpha is your Greek symbol on the note there. That is the symbol here, alpha. Your level of significance is your alpha, all right? now. We need that to figure out what the rejection region is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the normal curve. Why am I drawing the normal curve? Because remember in question B, we said we're going to be using the Z statistic. And that means using the normal distribution. So as we did in our previous learning units and the previous collabs, and which is why I've emphasized that it's very important to understand those collabs to move on. Okay, so there's a normal curve, and you guys should be a, should be a pro at this now. There's a normal curve. This is our z-axis. It's centered at zero. Yeah. Now this is where that alpha comes in, that five percent. All right. That alpha, that five percent. Okay. It determines the size of the rejection region. Now remember what I said earlier. I said this is a two-tail test. Right, you can see here, I wrote this is a two-tailed test. And why the two-tailed test is because when you see an equal to sign in H naught, as you can see here, that signifies it's a two-tailed test. So that means there's two regions that you could reject your H naught. There's one on the far left here, and then there's one on the far right. There's two regions. So I'm going to shade it in red to show you the region. So this is the one rejection region. This is the other rejection region. That's why it's a two-tailed test, because there's two rejection regions. Now, the size of this rejection region is determined by your alpha. Now, your alpha is 5%. So what that means is you have to use that entire alpha to uh, kind of be the volume of your rejection region. So what I mean is this red region needs to be alpha divided by two. You have to split your alpha into two parts, half of it here and half of it in the bottom. So here, it would be, if you split 5% into, into two equal parts, so you divide by two, you'll get 2.5% here, 2.5%. All right, and then you'll get 2.5% here. All right, 
So that's the size of our rejection region. Okay, we use our alpha determine to determine what the size is. Okay, if it, because it's a two-tailed test, you have to split that alpha into two. Okay, half of it on the right and half of it on the left. Okay, now this is something that you've done in, our, in the previous learning uh, in the collabs, but it's a bit different, and I'll explain why. Now, what I what I need to figure out is I know the area here. This area on the, uh, on the right, this red region is 0.25 or 2.5%. Now what I need to figure out is, what is the corresponding Z value on this axis that gives me that area? So I need to figure out what is this value on the Z axis here. Now remember, in the previous collabs, you could easily find this area, sorry, the Z value if you knew this area here. I'm going to shade this area in blue, okay? This area here is shaded in blue. Now, previously, we would have the Z value and you would find the area. Now you're working backwards. Now you know the area and you're going to find the Z value. So remember what I said in the previous learning uh, collabs. The entire area under this curve is 100%. So half of it, so the area on the right of zero is 50%, right? So if half this area is 50%, okay, so everything, basically all the area to the right, this is 50%, and I'm already using up 2.5% here in this red region, then what's the size of the blue region? What do you think it is? Put your thoughts in the chat. Very good, excellent, well done everyone. Yes, so this blue area, that's right, well done, okay. This blue area is 47.5%. I'm gonna write it as a decimal instead of a percent, and I'll, I'll explain why this makes things a bit easier, but you can write it as a percent, it's up to you. Now I know this blue area. Now remember, let me go to the table in your book, right? There's your table. Make this thing a bit bigger. Before we would be, we would know the Z value going down the margin and across from the top column. But now you are given the area, so that means you you given the value inside the table, and that value inside the table, okay, is 0.475. There it is here. So you're working backwards. Now you need to figure out what is the Z value that corresponds to this area of 0.475. And if you trace it back, it's 1.9, here's the chair, 1.9. And then the second decimal is going up. Yeah, so 1.96. Yes, very good, excellent. Okay, so I'm assuming everyone understands. I'm just gonna raise this part, this question mark, because now we know it. Yeah. Okay, so well done, everyone. So this value here, this point here, is 1.96. Everyone understand that before we move on? Let's see, you must put it in the chat. Everyone? Oh, good. Okay. Okay, this is a quiz for you now, right? Now, remember what I told you about the property of symmetry. Now, this value here is 1.96. And what is this value here that I'm marking with an X? It's polar opposites, basically. Yes, excellent, well done. So that's the negative value of it, exactly. Minus 1.96, minus 1.96, very good. Well done, everyone. Now these points are important because that's the cutoff. That tells me, remember see everything in the red region? That tells me that that's the rejection region. So that means anything on the left of minus 1.96, Anything on the left of it means I must reject H naught because that's the rejection region. And anything on the right of this value, where this red area is, tells me that I must also reject H naught. Now just keep in mind that your rejection region is always with regards to H naught, okay? It doesn't say anything about H1. When you have a rejection region, it's just telling you where you must reject H naught. 
right? So now, what have I what have I done here? I've shown that anything lower than minus 1.96, if I get a z value, okay, because this is a z axis, okay, this is a z axis going across. If I have a z value that's less than minus 1.96, that means I must reject h naught. If I have a z value that's greater than 1.96, so anyway here, I must also reject h naught. All right, so that's my critical values. But if I get anything, I'll use one more color because I know it's getting too much. Let me use green again. If I get anything in between these two values, anything in between, then I do the opposite. That means I must accept H naught. And this is step two. Okay, so I, if I had to say which step takes the most or takes most of the working, it'll be step two. Okay, so you've done pretty much uh, most of the hard work in the hypothesis testing here. Okay, if you've shown the rejection region, take what I've done. Okay, so that's step two done. Remember what I said earlier, there's step five steps. So now let's move on to step three. All right, so let me come back to black. Step three, I'm just gonna put a block here for step three. is calculate the test statistic. You calculate the st test statistic. Now remember in question B, we said it's gonna be a Z statistic. That's what we said. Now the formula for your Z statistic, now remember what I said earlier, this is your X bar. That's your sample average. X bar is 80.5. Okay, 80.5. and Right, and your mu is what the, is the true average is what the manager claims, which is 85. That's your mu, 85. Now the formula for Z statistic in step three, okay, is this formula here, which is nothing new to you. You've seen this in the last learning unit, the last collab. Z equals X bar minus mu all over sigma over square root n. This is what we did in the last code app. So the formula shouldn't be an, um, new to you. You're using this exact same formula. And all you need to do to work out the z value is plug in the values. Your x bar in the numerator, there it is. Your mu, it's 85. Your sigma is your standard deviation. There it is here. It's given to us, it's 25, that's your sigma. And we know our sample size. It's 132 people in our sample size. So that's our N, 132. So what I want you to do is plug those values into this formula and write the value that you get, because that's going to be our Z statistic. Here's your X bar, it's 80.5. Mu is 85. N is 132, and your sigma is 25. So put those values in and tell me what answer you get. Put it in the chat. Has anyone lost or not? Okay. Oh, that's lucky. I told everyone to work this out. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. We're gonna. I'm gonna maybe make some space on this board, and we're gonna. Great. I'm gonna make a new board. Hold on. Okay. So remember the four values I gave you. Uh. Okay. X bar is 80.5, mu is 85, n is 132, and your sigma is 25. All right, and the formula we need to work out is z equals x bar minus mu all over sigma divided by square root n. Right, you can put this in brackets if you want, you don't need to, it's up to you. Right, so now what we're gonna put in our calculator is 80.5 minus 85 all over 25 
divided by square root 132. And I think one person was right last time I checked the wrong values in. Yes, Arjun. Felicia? Are you, are you getting the value of minus? If you try it again, your calc minus 2.07. That's what you should get. Let me know if you're not getting this. If you're stuck somewhere, but you should get the value of minus 2.07. Okay, so you're gonna put everything, if you want, you can also put brackets for the whole thing. But this is the answer you must get. Minus 2.07. Okay, all right, so let's do it in a calculator, all right? So make sure your calculator is not in stats mode, okay? So if you want, put it, you can press, let me get my calculator so I can work it over with you. Just a, maybe a, a tip, all right? And maybe students tend to make this mistake when you start doing the uh, fraction and the, the denominator and the numerator. It's not, it's, it's on stat. Okay, take it off stat mode. And how you do that is you press mode and you press COMP. Mode, COMP. Now it's off stat mode. Then you'll see this fraction button. That's a block here, a shaded and then align the empty block. You can press that button, and now it gives you the numerator and the denominator. Okay, so it's blinking on the top, and in the numerator, you're gonna type this here, what I'm circling. Once you finish that, then move the cursor down. And the, how you move the cursor is you, it's that big button with all the arrows in it, the biggest button in your calculator. Move down, and then it goes into the denominator. And when you get to the denominator, you're going to type 25 divided by, and you're going to press the square root button. So when you share 25 divided by, okay, you're going to press the square root button. All right. And then you're going to type 132. And then you're going to hit equals to. And if, you, if you're getting a fraction, press S, press this button here, S, D, convert it to a decimal. And you should get minus 2.068, rounded, it gives you that. Let me know if you get that. If you're not getting, I'll show you another way. You're getting the fraction, okay. And are you able to enter this in the top? You're talking about which the cursor? Are you talking about the cursor? Where to move the the cursor to move it down? Is that the button you're talking about? Uh, hi, Daryl. No, so I've done the work. I've, I could do the fraction. I could put in the numerator and denominator. And then I'm getting a fraction um, answer. And then you said something oh. about, yeah, so I'm, at that part, I can't, I can't see that. You can't find this button. Yeah. Look I'm above, there's a button. Look at the delete button. Oh, right, right, right. OK, got it. OK, so That's you that? press that one. And equals to okay, got it. Two point zero six eight. Right. Yeah. Thank yes, you. Rounded gives you that. No worries. Okay. No worries. All right, everyone. Uh, oh, good. Let me uh, go back to the other whiteboard. All right. So we did all the hard work. The value we got here is minus two point zero seven. All right. Now we've done pretty much all the hard work. All right. Now I'm going to ask you something. This is the value we got. We got minus 2.07. The whole point of doing step three is to figure out does the value fall in the rejection region or the acceptance region, the green region or this blue area here. So 
So you tell me, looking at minus 2.07, where does it sit on the z-axis? Is it less than minus 1.96? Is it between minus 1.96 and 1.96? Where would you place this value? Very good. Yes. If you look at the if you look at the side, it's minus 2.07. So this is more negative than minus 1.96. That means it's on, it's here, okay? It's somewhere around here. You don't have to be exact. You just need to know where it lies. So it's definitely lower than minus 1.96. Yes, that's right. So it's here. So that means it falls in the rejection region. And that's pretty much step four. So we're almost done here. So step four, uh, pen. step four, Okay, because it falls in the rejection region, as we said here, it means we reject H naught. Right, perfect. And now step five is just writing it in words, which is pretty much uh, easy, easiest part. I'm gonna clear up everything because all I need now is just, I'll show you, I'm just gonna leave what I, what I need for step five. I need to include that step one because that's gonna, I'm going to use that in my conclusion. I don't need to graph anymore because I know I'm rejecting H naught. Almost done. All right. Now it's step five. Step five. And that's a conclusion. Okay, so before I write it out, firstly, we are rejecting H naught, okay? So if you look at what we've done in step four, we're rejecting H naught. If re rejecting means I, I don't believe step, um, sorry, I don't believe H naught. I believe H naught is false. That's what rejecting means. Okay, I reject H naught. But remember what I wrote here. I wrote that H naught is the manager's claim. Because remember, the manager believes that the average is 85. So based on step four, do we believe the manager's claim? What we found in step four, do we believe the manager's claim? Anyone, any takers? Exactly. Yes, we don't believe the manager's claim. That's right, okay? So on our find, based on our findings, we believe the manager's claim is false. So I'm gonna write everything in words here, okay? How you would write this uh, when you're concluding? Uh, you must start off with stating what the level of significance is. Because if your level of significance is 1%, it could change the entire outcome. You could, in fact, possibly accept H0. So it, it, your alpha or your level of significance does play a role, which is why you must always state that first. Okay, so at a 5% level of significance. Okay, that's what we will start off with. Okay, we reject H naught because that's what we uh, found in step four. And then this is the last part. We find that the manager's claim to be false, which is what everyone agreed on. We find that the manager's claim is false. That's it. That's your control. Let me just move this to the left here so you can see it. Uh, let me just break a line here. And that's step five. This is what you would write. Okay, you would start off with your level of significance. So for us, it is 5%. So at a 5% level of significance, we reject H naught. Okay, so that's what step four was. And then you just state it in terms of what the problem is. And here, it's about testing the manager's claim. So we find that the manager's claim is false. You could write a bit more if you want. Um, remember the manager saying that the average is 85 minutes. So you're saying that the manager's claim is false. You, what you're basically saying is that, and that the average chopping time is not 85 minutes. But generally, if you just stop at basically answering the question, 
in terms of the manager's claim, that's good enough. Let me just break a line here. That's it. All right. Any questions? That's you answering this entire question. One question I guess carries a lot of marks. I would say at least eight marks. So do get comfortable answering these types of questions. But as you can see, it's not very difficult. Okay, you follow those steps, step one to five. Okay, step one, you state the hypothesis. Step two, you find the rejection region with the graph like how I did earlier. Step three, you work out the test statistic, like what we did in this <coughs> uh, whiteboard, like what we did here in the calculator. Step four, that's an easy one. You just check where it falls. Do you reject H0? Do you accept H0? And step five, you write it out in words. Okay, any questions, anyone? I'm gonna go back to the chat. All good? Perfect. Fantastic. All right, so that's all I wanted to cover this evening. Um, in the, because the next co collab, I'm still gonna stick with this learning unit, but I'm gonna move on to proportions and what we did today was a two-sided test, but in the next one, we're gonna do a one-sided test. It's not a big difference, but it's important that you understand how to do it. Um, so yeah, I, I prefer to break it up. So I'm gonna do that in the, in the next lab. All right, but if, there's, if there aren't any questions, then enjoy your evening, everyone. And we'll chat soon. Thank you, no worries. Bye all.